Welcome to this second lecture on PPG. In this lecture, we will um, continue to discuss aspects related to PPG signal analysis and features uh, related to heart and respiration. But we will start with uh, the use of PPG for the detection of um, uh, pathologies related to sleep. So um, you've seen this cat before in another picture, and you've seen examples of use of audio signal for the detection of sleep stages. Um, sleep epochs are uh, sleep stages, and we usually go through four or five cycles um, of various sleep stages per night, and each cycle is about 90 minutes. And up to six sleep stages, I think in the previous paper, we um, had the non-REM um, phase um, or consider one, uh, so the audio signal was only used to detect uh, REM, non-REM um, and awake stages, while in this paper, um, this, this work, they go beyond and they go through various uh, sleep stages and one and two and three, and they all have different characteristics of possibly heart rate, respiration and movement. Um, you have also seen in the uh, lecture on audio that the gold standard for monitoring sleep is uh, PSG polysonography, and and that's a mixture of wires like um, uh, depicted in this picture, um, mainly containing EEG signal, um, muscle signal, uh, electro and, and eye movement signal. It also has respiration and cardiac activity measured as well. So it's a lot of uh, signals and it requires uh, quite um, close monitoring and it requires instrumentation. So it's good to be substituting it. The alternative for sleep's uh, detection are um, various, um, varied. So you, you can go through questionnaires. So people asking uh, questions either um, and in paper questionnaires or even through apps on phones and sleep diaries. Um, apps have been used just to ask the questions, but also uh, as passive sensors, uh, if the phone is placed on the mattress, uh, an accelerometer could um, understand movement. Um, and I have seen microphone for detecting of sleep apnea. Um, there are other sensors uh, that have been used for detection of uh, sleep phases, and these are ones that are placed on the mattress itself. They are purpose-built sensors of pressure and acceleration, and you put um, this uh, this pad often under your mattress and um, or over your mattress, and this this specifically stays there. So the the bed is instrumented to an additional sensor. And we will see in one of the last lectures that uh, radio signals have also been used, and those are contactless radio signals that work as sonar um, and uh, use reflection waves. And we'll, we have a lecture on, on this, but these are also been used to detect um, sleep and sleep stages. Um, just a quick um, slide to indicate that uh, one of the sleep pathologies we haven't yet talked about is sleep apnea. We haven't talked much about it. We, we, we did use some breathing um, examples in relationship to audio and how this could be detected then. Uh, but essentially here you have two graphs on um, the use of um, the interbeat interval. So the heart rate uh, variability value and the various sleep stages, indicating that if you're able to detect inter the interval, and we know, for example, that from PPG, you can detect that, you might be able to detect uh, pathologies or sleep apnea. So in this graph, um, on the top of the, the y-axis, you see a tau. It's, it's an indication of inter-beat um, values and intervals. And it, it, it corresponds quite well to the ground truth of the various stages of sleep. And you have light sleep, deep sleep, REM sleep, and wake. Um, and in sleep apnea, you see how um, the sleep stages, so first you can compare the bottom of panel B with the bottom of panel A, where the ground truth is. And you can see that, unfortunately, during sleep apnea, there's a lot of waking time. There's a, there's a lot of variations of the various sleep stages. And um, in the top, figure 
you have a much different picture of that so that the sleep stage is very so um, all we're saying is perhaps that if the interbeat measure is able to mirror uh, the various um, ground through stages that you have here, and it seems that you're able to pattern match the interbeat lines with the ground truth at the bottom in both panels, then you will be able to detect sleep apnea. This is kind of the reason um, that explains um, this, this picture. Uh, in, in, instead of just talking of PPG, as we're talking more generally on sleep, and we've seen audio already on sleep, um, I want to refer you to this work that is essentially um, saying that commercial grade um, sleep apps are not very good at detecting uh, sleep stages because the apps are essentially only monitoring um, your um, how much you're using them and some of them have the accelerometer if you put it on the bed but um you know this is very inaccurate some of these apps um just some some of these apps actually use some um audio like i think sleep cycle in particular might use some audio some others um, just possibly even consider how often you use the phones um, how you read this table, um, sleep efficiency is uh, the, the ratio between the total sleep time over the in-bed time. So it tells you how much of the time you spend in bed. Um, you're actually, in fact, sleeping. Uh, wake, light sleep, deep sleep, sleep onset, uh, wake time percentages or, or percentage of time. And you can see here that all these values are essentially... Um, correlations. Um, so zero is no correlation. And these values are quite low. In particular, also the, uh, the, the correlation coefficient uh, is not very high, so it's not very significant. So in general, this, this figure means that the apps are not quite so precise. Um, one other um, technique that has been used is related to acceleration. Um, so accelerometer measure movement, movement pattern associated with wake and sleep. So it detects very well wake and sleep. is often unable to detect motionless awake. And that's why um, this, this can be a problem. It's, uh, it, it kind of overestimate the amount of time you're sleeping. And so PPG has been seen as a good alternative um, and quite more precise. Um, and at the moment, uh, you've seen the paper on audio. It was actually a uh, very... Um, a very seminal paper and it placed a microphone on the bed so it's not a consumer device well ppg are already embedded in consumer device and they've been used and uh, there's some literature now trying to prove that they can do better than uh, or more similar to polysonography um, than um, to the to detect sleep and pulse very variability so interbeat interval is actually a measure that is very important and we saw it in the example of sleep apnea um so, so the, the literature shows that it's better, it's a bullet two, uh, it's better than actigraphy. So it's better than accelerometer only signal. And sleep stages monitoring is still accurate enough. So this is uh, obviously, we start seeing devices that give you um, examples of this and um, you know they show you sleep stages, show you when you we're, were awake. Sometimes I had um, a graph like this and I knew at some point that I was awake, so I, I didn't quite, um, trusted, but the technology is getting better. And over, you know, remember that I think the difference with polysonography is that here you start having a picture of someone's sleep over uh, a year. Uh, while in polysonography, you need to get someone in the lab, and often you don't have more than one night um, of example. And we know our one night can be sample, can be a good sample of how we behave. Um, and so even if uh, this sort of uh, technologies have errors, um, they're definitely the way to go in giving you uh, over time continuous longitudinal behavior. So that the community kind of agrees on this aspect. And here is the same, same paper that compared PSG with apps, also compared devices with, uh, with, with PSG. Again, here is not a clear picture. Um, it, it talks about overestimation or underestimation of light sleeves like Fitbit Alta, underestimated duration of light sleep. Um, so, so the correlation of Fitbit Alta with various measures of deep sleep, REM sleep, and uh, wake up time after sleep onset, WASO, uh, 
um, is is good. Uh, so there are some kind of good correlation uh, with good correlation coefficients. So, so the, the, there's a good signal here. Uh, it's not perfect, uh, and all devices have limitations, but we're getting there. Um, and so PP, PPG is becoming um, trustable. And and obviously. In most of these devices, the secret, there's a secret recipe on how they calculate this. So they don't tell, Fitbit doesn't tell you how this is done. Uh, but there are papers out there that talk about how this could be done. And so here is one. Um, so they consider sleep epochs of 30 seconds, the count, the motion features um, using an accelerometer. Um, and then they, they use that to detect the movement part of things. So movement is detected with an accelerometer. But on the PPG, a number of features are calculated on the heart rate variability or interbeat variability. So interbeat uh, variability, there are some components. I, I won't talk about all this feature, but uh, just to give you a general description that um, detecting some of the high frequency parts in the DFT um, is important and able to distinguish various phases. The low frequency parts also, um, the um, root mean square error of, of uh, the difference of the interbeats and the proportion of successive interbeats that differ more than a certain amount over, you know, normalized over a certain value, uh, mean heart rate, 90 percentile of heart rate, um, are example of features that I used in this paper to distinguish the various sleep stage. But they also sleeping breathing features. Heart is not just uh, one, is it just one? Um, motion is the other one and breathing is the third one. And so again, over this frequency spectrum, uh, various high frequency power component, low frequency power component, very low frequency power components have been used to distinguish the various phase. Another study that is interesting, just because uh, we cannot, we don't know the algorithms used by uh, behind these devices. This is an aura ring. Um, and this is one of my students wearing an aura ring. Um, and, and here is a study, um, a quite recent one, I think 2001, um, where they also uh, shown that the aura ring in their study overestimated the time to um, sleep. Um, and then they overestimate the wake up time or sleep onset. And so uh, underestimated certain phases, overestimated the deep sleep phases. Um, so there is literature in trying to understand how this works and um, see if this can be trusted. But again, here we don't know we don't know how um, the the algorithm works. Obviously, um, by looking at the papers that use the features, we have an idea on how they would have done it because um, they often start with existing uh, research literature, uh, but we don't know exactly what they what they do. Now, in this part of the work uh, of the lesson, I would like to um, go back again to something we've um, covered a little bit for accelerometer and a little bit for audio. And in this case, again, um, unfortunately, labeled PPG data is not plenty. Um, if you think of your devices, Google and Apple start having um, a quite large set of PPG um, and even audio um, data on from our devices. If we focus on PPG, um, I wear my watch most days. And so um, Apple yeah. is receiving quite um, a large amount of samples for me, but the data is not labeled. And so we've seen similar examples when I talked about accelerometers and IMU. So uh, transfer learning worked in that case. And here is an example of a repetition of how uh, transfer learning also has been used uh, for heart rate variability measurement. So the idea is that um, the medical practitioners over and, and bioengineers over the years have collected large amounts of ECG data, so the electrocardiogram data. And um, they have also um, labeled that um, in various cases. Um, and in this case, uh, they, 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 they had ECG and polysonography data. So they have the ground truth label from polysonography and they have the ECG data collected in polysonography. 
And so can we make use of this to then um, build model that can be applied to PPG data, which is often a lot, but not label. So the idea here that we want to train on the ECG data and possibly on the PCG, PSG labels, and then transfer to lower data regime where we have possibly even less data, but also have data um, possibly without label in general. Um, so in, in this paper, of course, to, to show that the model is useful, they consider a case where ha they have low PPG data and some P PSG labeling on the PPG data. But the idea of course is once you build a PPG model, obviously you can use it on large PPG data sets. But obviously you can't prove that that's useful unless you have the labels somehow. So yeah, um, I hope you understand what I'm saying. So how does this uh, paper, this work uh, goes? Well, they build an ECG model based on ECG data and PSG labeling. Here there's abundant data. They transfer and freeze a subset of the model weights and then they fine tune to a PPG, build a PPG model, and then they use it to, um, to find, to, to see if it works well on PPG data. In more detail, they use a data set called Siesta um, on ECG. They pre-train this on um, the, they pre-train an ECG model on that. They evaluate the model um, on the ECG data set to make sure that it has good performance. But also they take that model and they use it, they create two baselines. First, they evaluate the model so they don't change anything. They take the model and see how it does in performance on PPG. And that's a baseline. Um, it probably is not a good baseline. It won't work very well because ECG and PPG are different signals. The second thing they try is to take the model and they retrain the model completely on the PPG data. That's the second baseline. And the last three baseline, the last three, sorry, um, tests, six, seven, and eight, are examples where uh, the model is fine tuned. Only some layers of the models are uh, retrained. And uh, this model contains some um, layers uh, that are. Uh, let's say fully connected layers. So the, the part, the LSTM layer that is contained in the original ECG model is never retrained. Um, is the domain model and the decision model that are retrained as a fully connected layer. And the decision model is essentially a model to um, decrease the number of features that acts almost as a PCA. And model eight is where both these layers are retrained. And they do compare, compare the performance. If you look at the second panel um, here, this is accuracy. And we see that the accuracy increases in general until quite high accuracy. This is model eight when the model is um, retrained, the, the two components of the model are retrained. These are the two, um, essentially this is the normal uh, model. So, so if we go back one, this is four, five, six, and seven, and eight. So it's five of them, you have five colors. Um, and you can see the various, um, also the performance on the various uh, sleep stages separately. The kappa, um, the coin kappa is how much each model is in agreement with PSG. And we see that again, the line is increasing. So um, the model, the, the fine tune model combined is, is actually uh, has a higher Cohen Kappa. So I'm going back uh, a bit to the concept of PPG and motion. And I take this opportunity to introduce a new type of uh, graph, which is a blank Alman plot. Um, and you might find it useful perhaps uh, to use when you analyze uh, in signal processing data of this kind in particular heart. So uh, the ground truth here is uh, polar seven strap ground truth. Um, so uh, the data from the polar seven strap. And we are considering wrist um, devices um, and running of various, um, various of these devices actually in fact um, some of them are um, 
I think one of them is in fact even a mirable. But the ideal, all these plots look similar. So how does a, an Altman, blunt Altman plot works? On the x-axis, you have the average of the measures, meaning um, you have two measures. Uh, one is uh, the, the, the mean of, so, so one is the value of uh, the polar strap and one is the Garmin value, let's say in this measure. And so the higher the average of the two menu means uh, that um, the heart, this is heart rate. So the higher the heart rate, um, it sort of means that this person is moving. But the difference between the measures um, would indicate perhaps a sort of trend, might, maybe one of the devices measure higher than the others. In this case, we see no trend, but we see that the higher um, the means goes and the the larger the discrepancy. So there's no agreement uh, between the two um, values somehow, indicating that the technology doesn't seem to have um, a good performance over, over sleep. Um, the, the, the difference seems to go up and down. Uh, and so there is no really trend that we can see. So in motion, um, we haven't quite found a good answer for using PPG. Um, now we said before that perhaps uh, PPG on the wrist wasn't gonna be very good because PPG on the wrist is, um, uh, wrist is one of the worst places we move it a lot uh, while we do activities, perhaps running. Um, and so uh, perhaps the ears are a part of our body that would give us a better PPG signal because even while we move our body, the head remains quite stable. Um, the reality although is, and this is a uh, work that we have done in collaboration with uh, Nokia Bell Labs um, paper um, coming out soon, that uh, shows that there are other motions that might um, not help the movement uh, pattern detection. And um, so here are uh, movement of our head that we would do brow raise, a lip pillar, mouth stretch like this and, and shake. And so um, what you see in the graphs here is the red curve is the PPG of that user in a stationary case. And the gray lines are uh, the same user in various acts of a shake, then bra razor, lip puller, and mask stretches. And you can see that uh, there's quite a bit of variation in those and quite a bit of uh, signal noise that would need to be um, canceled before the PPG, real PPG signal, uh, which is a user really being still, in fact, um, is detected. So there's still lots of challenges on, on the motion side um, to detect all this, especially uh, from various parts of our bodies, not just the wrist. But there are different challenges somehow. And then um, in the last part of this lecture, I would like to discuss aspects related to um, something that has been in the news quite a bit, and that the skin color. Because of the PPG signal um, working on light reflection, um, obviously the, the color of the surface of whatever is in between might have an effect. Um, there's a paper, um, so I'm citing here three or four papers in the next three slides that discuss various things um, in, in paper two, which is uh, cited in the next um, slide, uh, which is a paper published in 2020. They found no significant difference in accuracy across skin tones, but found differences by devices in response to change of activity. So it, it's really not conclusive. And there are previous reports, and that's another paper published um, in 2017, finding that wearables using green light and larger errors in tracking heart rate and energy expenditure for individuals with darker skin tones, especially for exercising. And then one thing that the paper discusses is the fact that um, for skin tones, they, they've used this fixed factory skin type scale that was in originally, um, used for propensity to skin to burn. Um, and so it's a skin scale, it's a skin type scale that perhaps it might not be adequate, at least there is a push um, to indicate that. They also said that too few people with the darkest skin tones were included in one of the papers. 
And so here are some of the references. Sorry, uh, the third one should be a reference three. But um, this is a nature paper from this year, um, 2022, that again um, talks about how skin color affects the oxygen sensors, the oxygen saturation specifically. And in this case, uh, they cite uh, a number of papers um, concluding that in fact, in darker skin um, colors, the, the readings might be affected. And there's this nice picture uh, where they they talk about how um, this is about the transmitting light. So it's again, it's about the, the clip um, and not about the watches. And there's a, th there's a way in which they say that the signals are affected by melanin, which is distributed to the skin. And um, melanosome in darker skin are larger and more numerous than those in light skin. And therefore, um, they, they, there is an effect of light and, and this needs to be studied more. So all these studies are concluding uh, that essentially we need to be careful and uh, we probably don't yet have enough information. Um, in fact, if we do have information, it's some negative information telling us, be careful, we might need different algorithms, we might need to look at things differently, we might need larger studies. So if you're interested in this area, I think there's uh, quite a bit of data collection to be done. Um, literature seems to be coming out uh, thick and fast continuously, and um, it's a very interesting area to, to look at. And I hope we solve it because uh, biases in our senses are really not something we want, especially when we deal with medical um, consideration and medical issues. And with that, I will stop sharing and I will um, um, stop recording. Thank you very much.